Mary Lou, can you get us going, please? Yes. Thanks. Hello and welcome. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, uh, Client Relations at CIM. On behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of CIM, we thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to begin to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional and unceded territory of the Canyon Cahat a place which was long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Um, as well, most of us attending today are also on a traditional unceded territory. Today's session is the second of a series focusing on the TSM protocols. And now with further ado, I'd like to, to present the moderator of today's session, Teresa Neabizi, who is the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee at CIM and is also technical leader, diversity and inclusion at Valley Base Metals. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you very much, Mary Lou. Yeah, so good, after, good, good afternoon. We're in certain time zones and good morning and others. Uh, we're so pleased you could join us today. Um, I just want to maybe preface by saying um, I do I do come here today representing uh, CIM's Diversity, Inclusion and Advisory Committee. And our goal really at uh, CIM is to make sure that we're encouraging diversity and inclusion within CIM and mine, the mining industry at large. Uh, we're really working towards this goal through uh, encouragement of increasing diversity uh, in our committees, our conferences, as well as you know, in, in occasions like this where we see synergy with the mining industry on shared uh, topics where we can collaborate. Uh, speaking of that collaboration, what we've done here is in collaboration with the mining industry, Human Resources Council, Mining Association of Canada, and CIM, what we've brought to you is a series of uh, five webinars which are going to be re re uh, reviewing the Towards Sustainable, Equitable, Diverse and Inclusive Workplaces Protocol. And the goal here is to make sure that as an industry, we're moving together, we're learning together and really fostering that collaboration. Uh, because of course, people are, are at the center of all of our operations. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is the, the, this session is recorded and there will be a record of the one that actually took place on January 31st, uh, session one that we're going to share with you. And at that session, we were uh, really fortunate to get an overview of um, the TSM protocol as well. Rio Tinto was there talking about implementation of these new requirements and, and, and Mir was there uh, take, giving us some insight on technical resources that are available to people in that journey. Now, I'm going to move forward, but I just want to refresh our memories here to say that, you know, these protocols will include requirements such as uh, the corporate co uh, to make sure that a corporate commitment is a, that is aligned with TSM framework uh, on equitable, diverse and inclusive workplaces is available. Uh, a corporate strategy that is developed and then later on implemented through engagement with a cross section of people who bring diverse perspectives and experiences. And that we actually have objectives that are that are clearly set around leadership, recruitment, retention, and representation. And also, with, there's a mention about the independent review of our workplace culture within those results that are informing full engagement. Uh, we really look forward to hearing from the speakers today about how they, they as companies, are implementing or meeting, and uh, what are some of the and how are they meeting these different requirements? So I, I'm very uh, glad to have on the call today our colleagues in industry. I will say, uh, Dr. Jackie Scales. Um, um, who is the Director of Inclusion and Diversity at Tech Resources Limited, as well as Uche Ajesa, who is the Head of Inclusion and Diversity and Equity at Newmont. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. And um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, through a quick conversation really around corporate leadership and strategy um, and how we are looking at ensuring that we have that commitment. So I'll talk to you a little bit today about the journey that we have taken at Tech Resources. Um, and if you uh, have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We will monitor them as we're going through. And there is a uh, some time for Q&A at the end of the session after um, myself, Uche and Leslie have gone through the presentations. So on the next slide, um, what informs our strategy at Tech? We really um, make sure that we have a listening and research component to what we do. And so making sure that we hear what our employees say, 
Um, so we have a biannual survey and regular focus groups that center around inclusion and respectful workplace and how our employees perceive um, their workplace and their operations. We obviously look at performance against ESG ratings and rankings. And then we do do an internal annual review against the industry and our peers and see what's happening from a regulatory perspective. We are a global organization, so we do have to take that into consideration. And then what we do is, um, you know, we, we review, we address, adjust. We do have an inclusive, respectful workplace uh, committee, which is our senior committee chaired by our CEO, Jonathan Price. Um, and has uh, myself and a few of his direct reports on that to ensure that we are um, governing. We do have accountability to our board as well um, as a committee. And then we look at um, engagement. So we uh, work with our EDI committees. We have an 11 of them across the organization, our HR committee, um, our employee inclusion networks, and then we continue to evolve our strategy as we go through the year. The next slide talks about um, what's our approach. So when we think about setting goals or we think about, um, you know, where we want to be as an organization, we really need to consider and understand the differences between outputs and um, strategic outcomes and business impact. So how do we measure all three? How do we make sure we understand the difference between them? And then really think about what is current state? What do we need to continue to maintain when we have good momentum? And then what is aspirational? And in aspiration, when we're thinking about what is aspirational, that we have the right um, communication, behaviors to get to that aspirational goal. And we don't have unintended um, consequences. So we really think that through. Then we say, you know, how are we aligning to our overarching culture and uh, organizational strategy. And then we need to think about in um, our EDI strategy, the unique perspectives and needs of each of our operations. So as I mentioned, we're a global organization. So there may be some regulatory differences. There may be cultural norms and nuances we have to consider and think about the site. Is it you know, a fly in, fly out? Is it operating at altitude? Um, taking all that into consideration. And then we do set measurable objectives and we review them annually and semi-annually in some places. And then we have reviews quarterly with each business head. So on the next slide, lots of words on this slide. And really here, this is how are we advancing um, and showing accountability and commitment as an organization? So we have at Tech four focus um, areas or pillars. Strategy and leadership is one. So how are we strengthening the accountability of our management? How are we ensuring that our strategy is aligned with our business priorities and our community priorities in which we operate? So we look at things like uh, respectful workplace policy and procedure. So we have implemented um, a respectful workplace policy that uh, is an organizational global policy. And then we have a standard and a procedure that helps um, operations and corporate understand how we react to any type of gender-based violence, what our protocols are, what our definitions are. Um, we also wanna strengthen our measurement um, and evaluation both in our business units and across the organization. And so we have training and we look at who has performance. We have KPIs on our um, executive scorecards that cascade all the way down the organization. When we think of outcomes, we want to see an increase in those surveys I mentioned. Um, and uh, while we know there will be um, an increase in cases of harassment and discrimination, because we've started this journey, we want to see a decrease overall. And then um, our business impact is that we have reduced lost time injuries um, and uh, an increased number of innovative pro projects. When we think about our people from a, a retire a, a, uh, attraction and retention perspective, we want to make sure that we have a diversified um, workforce. And so really looking at um, making sure we have uh, spaces for inclusion and accessibility, that we have um, identity specific retention and advancement strategies. So we might look at different demographics and say, where do we need to have a focus in any particular region, site or year? And so what does that look like from an output perspective? 
Um, the number of changes, what our, our continuous improvement looks like. Um, if we've made changes to our operations or to our, our sites from a physical perspective or in process and policy. And when we think about outcomes, again, we're seeing our IND index. So that's the surveys we run. We see an increase there. We see um, equity of pay and advancement considering gender and other aspects of diversity. So when we think about succession and performance management, we, we see um, an increase in our diversity in headcount as well. And then when we think about the business impact, why is this important and, and how what does that mean for us? We see and want to see a reduction in voluntary turnover, a reduction in absenteeism, um, and an improved number of local job applicants from the communities in which we operate. The third pillar we um, really focus on is the communication and learning. And so how do we create opportunities to increase awareness, to ensure everyone understands what a respectful, inclusive workplace looks like, how they're empowered and what their accountability is as an employee at tech, and how we have that inclusive culture. And so we've developed learning pathways to expand EDI knowledge. So we have um, foundational training, we have very specific skill training and training on certain um, concepts around inclusive leadership, around anti-racism, around gender-based violence, really depending on where we are in the organization. And so if we think about your metrics, we've got, you know, how many people have we trained? How many um, days of cultural significance do we observe based on um, our, our year? And then um, actions taken away from the survey. So we do the survey, we look at it and we say, what are the things our employees are telling us we need to address? As I mentioned earlier, that forms our strategy. And so we look at which ones we have been able to close in the year. When we think about outcomes, um, again, we have a, a better score. Um, and in our focus groups and survey rate and surveys, we see signal improvement in relationships and in um, understanding of our strategy and our, our core values. And what's the impact at the end of the day for us at tech? We have increased employee engagement. Um, we see high rates of return from parental leave. And we also see increased scores and engagement and um, retention. The last one is around our employees' experience. So what do they experience in their day-to-day? -day? Um, when we think about the core initiatives for that, we have a framework for EDI committees and employee inclusion networks. Um, and we also have what we call inclusion centers. So um, we have areas that are a safe space in which we um, have accredited counselors um, or psychologists that are available to all of our employees and any contractors on site. Um, should they need to access any information? Should they need to report anything? It is an avenue for reporting. And so we've created those spaces um, and continue to create them across the organization. When we think about outputs, it's, you know, how many, how many networks do we have? from uh, an inclusion perspective? How many committees do we have? And then um, what's happening at our inclusion centers? How many people are using them? The um, outcome is again, we have improved scoring against our EDI benchmarks externally as well as internally from our surveys. And then we have increased brand awareness and commitment. So on the next slide, talking a little bit about an example of gender equity. So we started our journey on gender equity in 2016. Um, so we did our very first gender pay equity review. Um, and we looked at our Tech Chile um, operation and head office and looked at how we increase the representation of women in the total workforce. And as you can see, from sort of 2016 um, to 2023, we've had a significant increase in percentage of women. And that is, um, you know, through an EDI journey where we have created a policy, we have um, created a strong focus in Chile as we were expanding our uh, Casablanca operation. We also acknowledged our LGBTQ2S plus um, employees. We uh, were fortunate enough to name a female board chair we have 25% women and 33% visible minorities on our board of directors. And um, we started our training 
we did set ourselves a target of 30% um, gender representation in our hiring ramp up for QB. And uh, we achieved that as well as signing on to the UN Women's Empowerment Principles. So with a strong focus and commitment, um, we've been able to realize a number of the goals and see the outcomes that we had set for ourselves for gender equity. On the next slide, you know, what are some of the challenges we face as we look to reaching um, AAA? And the first one really is uh, transparency around discrimination and harassment data. Uh, you know, organizationally, we have not been great in having a single source to better understand um, the data and then, you know, getting to a place where we're able to share that. Um, also ensuring that we can accurately measure equity on our recruitment and retention. So um, we've just gone through a big technology upgrade, which will give us uh, the ability to have people self-identify where we can um, leverage that data and look at it from a, a recruitment and retention perspective and really making sure that we're balancing doing the work and measuring the work. So not just having a, you know, a ton of programmatic things to get us to where we need to be, but that we have measurable, sustainable, um, respectful workplace culture that enables us to get to where we want to be from a AAA rating perspective. I do have, um, next slide, yeah, some examples um, to share with you all as well. And so the first example is looking at how do we measure leadership and strategy at the corporate level? So we've created a goal, which is to implement our strategy. We have a two year strategy and then think about performance indicators. So how can we um, show this? And we say 100% of our leaders have a performance objective in their scorecard. Um, how many of our staff participate in training and looking at our biannual human rights reviews that we do. Um, another example could be it, the implementation of text respectful workplace policy and gender-based violence and harassment protocol. And so I mentioned we've implemented this, but we look at once it's in, we want a reduction of cases in dis disrespectful workplace um, conduct that we have 100% of our employees trained um, and that we see a difference in the human rights review. Uh, a couple other examples that I have for you on the next slide are, you know, how do we advance um, EDI in, in our operations? So what would it look like for our operational folks? And so our general manager could have a statement about um, strengthening EDI, could be a statement about representation in candidate pools. And then what does that look like for a superintendent? So how do you manage uh, sorry, how do you support the requirement and strengthen diversity of, of workforce and initiatives, whether that be time off for training, whether that be um, leading a training, whether that be um, empowering your, generous, your general supervisor or your crew supervisor to have value shares that talk about EDI and the expectation of everyone as an empowered, um, courageous safety leader in our organization to address conduct and behavior that does not align with our values. And so it could be, you know, sponsoring individuals, it could be ensuring people have opportunity to train, um, and then making sure that we are having conversations around um, career interests, around development opportunities, um, and uh, looking at how we're ensuring that succession and performance management is balanced. And with that, um, I will pass it over to my friend and colleague, Uche, to talk about what uh, the journey looks like at Newmont. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you, uh, whether that's a good morning or good afternoon or potentially maybe even good evening, depending on where you find yourselves. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the journey that Newmont has has undertaken as well. Um, a couple of things, perhaps, just to set the stage. One of which is um, uh, a story, a short story that I'll tell everyone around. Um, in a in a past life, uh, I had the opportunity to visit one of uh, one of our sites at the organization where I was working, uh, and I met with the safety director there, uh, and I walked up to him, and they had you know pretty stellar. 
safety um, safe safety metrics over the years. And so I, I went up to him and I asked him, you know, one of the things that I hope to learn from my trip there was understanding how they've prioritized safety. Um, and he basically said, you know, let me stop you there. Uh, safety is not something that we prioritize here. Safety is the condition that we work underneath here. He said inherently, when you think about the prioritization of something, um, that, that that opens the door that you might deprioritize it at some point if something sort of takes some, something overtakes the priority. But if it is the condition that you sort of work underneath, that it no longer becomes something that sort of you choose to or choose not to do. Um, it is, it's the condition that you set forth. And so that reframe has sort of helped me think about, you know, what, what we as an organization here at Newmont want to accomplish and how do we make it the condition that we, that we operate underneath, right? So um, the idea of doing, <clears throat> excuse me, doing things um, that, that may fall up and down the prior to priority list, how do we, enable the organization such that um, inclusion and diversity becomes um, a, a condition under, with, under which sort of work is done. So I just wanted to sort of plant that seed with, with folks and, um, and ask you to consider that as well as um, wanted to, to another uh, point that someone also uh, shared with me some time ago is this journey is uh, ever evolving and it's sort of ever shifting and ever changing and it, it requires constant investigation on what you're doing. Um, I love what Jackie shared in terms of just the rigor that they use to sort of measure and ensure that they're going down the right path. Uh, what's I think important for me as well is to don't do the work alone. Don't feel like you have to do the work alone. And that I think is cer certainly indicative of within the organization, but I also think that's across industry um, and even sort of spanning spanning multiple industries. You know, try to build out your network um, in such a way that you feel like you can take some of these potentially very sort of tenuous and, and scary steps together with someone. So my one of my commitments um, after this call is to continue my uh, connection with both Jackie, <clears throat> excuse me, and Leslie, um, to ensure that I'm staying across, you know, all the good work that they're doing within their organizations and feeling like I can, you know, move uh, together with Newmont, um, move in a direction where we feel like we can do, we're doing it together and sort of not isolated. So just wanted to frame frame a couple of those, those points. Hopefully that's useful for, for folks. Um, as we walk through the slides, I think um, the path of the journey that I'll take you on is a bit of where Newmont has sort of come from. There's been a very story journey up to this up to this point. Um, so I'll share a little bit of insights from from there. Also, I will sort of set set a um, set of baseline understanding of sort of how we consider this work and and um, how we tie it and connect it to the overall organization um, uh, purpose and, and vision and values um, and tying that also to our people strategy and making sure that we're clear on what those connection points are and then also talk talk with you a little bit about um, kind of what what path forward looks like how the the, the TSM um, the TSM protocols and framework inform our de our decision making and sort of what all that looks like. So on this page, um, you'll see again this is a bit of an eye chart, but you'll you'll get a, a sense of where Newmont has has come. We've done a lot of um, I think really useful and, and and beneficial and purposeful things. You'll see sort of anchored at the bottom is our uh, our gender um, parity journey. Um, the top line being the executives and the bottom line being overall representation across the organization. Um, again, we're, we're, we're very kind of, we're, we're pleased and proud of the, the progress we've made so far, but recognize there's, there's, there's quite a bit more, more to do and we are, we're ever more committed to, to doing so. Inclusion is one of our, 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 our pillars, our values uh, for Newmont across the organization. And I think that's, that's quite key and important. We'll touch a, touch a little bit about that later on in, in one of the slides. A couple of things that I just want to highlight um, as it pertains to this work here. Um, we have a partnership with Paradigm for Parity which has helped us really be able to 
baseline where we are on our journey um, and the things and interventions that I think that that we that we understand we need to take. I think Jackie touched a little bit on this in the sense that it's very important to understand where you are as an organization and sort of not arbitrarily consider that, but actually to dive deep into um, what are we seeing? What's the information? What are the different types and streams of data that we're tapping into, um, be it a listening survey or other types of interventions that are informing us that, okay, we have a good sense of where we are and therefore we have a good sense of where, where we'd like to go and how to sort of move that forward. And then you measure that, right? You measure the progress against, against that. So Paradigm for Parity and, and their, their tools um, have helped us really um, drill down into uh, our representation journey and what that needs to look like and how we structure things in such a way that helps us continue to sort of move forward. Um, also, our senior, uh, our, our senior level leadership um, has um, inclusion and diversity measures tied to their compensation, as well as our leadership across the organization from a performance review standpoint also has um, have, have, have measures within their yearly goal setting um, and performance setting um, around inclusion and diversity. So I think tying that accountability um, quite explicitly um, to what we expect of our leaders, I think is quite helpful to ensure that uh, we, we're moving forward in, in a proper, uh, proper direction and that um, our leaders are sort of clear on how they contribute to Newmont kind of reaching its goals. Um, we also have, uh, we've made some commitments to, um, to place uh, inclusion and diversity resources within each of our business units. I think that's, that's quite key, right? That signals to the organization that we're, we're not simply uh, talking the, the talk, we're walking the walk as well by putting resources behind this work um, and ensuring that, um, that we can stay uh, tied into all the different contextual things that happen at our business units um, across our regions. Um, and committing resources, I think, is a, is a great signal, signal there. Um, and then also um, our BRGs um, are an incredibly crucial part to, to the work that we've been able to progress thus far and the work that we aim to progress in the future. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the BRGs sort of in the next, next slide and some of the, the work that they have catalyzed. Um, but I think uh, I, I, I'd like to underscore the, the, the benefit and the importance of BRGs um, just as a general statement. It have, they have created such a, an amplification of the culture that, that we aspire to, uh, to stand up here at Newmont um, and, and the work that they do, especially considering the fact that you know, many of the individuals, if not actually, in fact, all of the individuals participating in, in our BRGs are, are volunteers. Um, and so the fact that they're taking the time to do this work um, on top of their, their their daily responsibilities, I think is is quite telling. And they are an incredible catalyst that we tap into often to ensure that the the work that we're doing um, is is going down the right path. So I won't sort of belabor this slide uh, anymore. You you can um, certainly read through some of the different things. If anyone has any questions on anything on the slide, again, happy to to drill down a little bit further. Um, if we pop to the to the next slide, um, so our BRGs, as I mentioned, we have twenty nine um, thus far, um, and that's a constant sort of of ebb and flow. We we hope to uh, to bring forth more, um, but you can see sort of the dispersion of of where these groups sit. Um, and how they really create um, very safe um, and productive spaces for people to find themselves, you know, based on the purpose of the BRG um, and sort of align with, with the BRGs in, in, in their regions. Um, so I think the, the beauty of this is you don't have to necessarily be, um, you know, so let's say, for example, you, you happen to be based out of North America or you happen to be based out of Africa. Um, we don't simply just have corporate, um, corporate being Denver, Colorado, corporate BRGs, we have them all across the board. So um, we feel really good about the idea that regardless of where you find yourself as an employee, based on where you're located, uh, you're able to find groups um, that you can tap into. Um, and it really it starts to expand your network around uh, what's happening within your site, what's happening within your business unit or your region, and then also what's happening across the, across the company. So our BRGs, where I, I find uh, that Newmont is quite blessed with uh, the, the type um, and the level of work that our BRGs um, do on behalf of championing the culture that we, that we hope to see. One such uh, effort that they've done that they catalyzed was um, our symbols of exclusion work 
Um, and so we'll talk a little bit later on around sort of um, the notion that I mentioned earlier about how to sort of make ID and either the one of the conditions under which you work. And that I think requires looking across this, the symbols that exist in your organization, the systems that sort of wrap around, wrap around those and the behaviors um, that are being sort of exhibited across your organization. And that symbols of exclusion work um, is a fantastic example catalyzed by, um, by our, uh, our BRGs around how you might approach that um, in your organization. So if we move, uh, move to the next slide. Um, we'll, we'll drill down a little bit into sort of the symbols of exclusion. So a symbol in this context could certainly be something physical, right, that you can see and, and, and visible and or visual in terms of like a sign um, or, or something within a facility that either exists or does not exist. Um, a symbol can also be behavior, though, right? Like a, a symbol can be um, what are the different um, um, mythologies that, that exist uh, within your organization that either are um, catalyzing or supporting the the type of the environment that you're they're hoping to achieve and the type of culture you're hoping to achieve or conversely that are perhaps inhibiting it that are that are creating a barrier um, for people to truly feel like they belong um, and they they can thrive and, and then they are valued and so this symbols of exclusion work I think is a, a fantastic way you can see all the different categories underneath the the, the category area um, that at all of our across all of our different sites and even and in, in our corporate facilities as well, um, the exercise uh, to sort of just really boil it down and simplify it. The exercise is really investigating when you look around. So a simple example that that you can see on the right is um, what are the what's the state of the facilities? Are the are something like a bathroom? Um, do do people do people of different um, genders, um, different different identities, etc., uh, feel that where the bathrooms are placed, or perhaps even you know where, uh, for example, a, a nursing room or something in that in that space, that they are in a space that is safe, frankly, um, and that feels like they can access them as needed um, to maximize their the 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 feeling or the sense of inclusion um, at that facility. Um, and if not, then you can start making you can pretty start making you can start making lists and checklists of what sort of needs to change. PPE, I think, is another good one. Uh, do you have um, uh, maternity PPE, um, which exists out there in the marketplace, or are you simply asking your your um, uh, the women at your site to simply just wear larger men's, uh, uh, you know, men's men's styled or men's sized uh, PPE, right? So things like that that. Are you symbolizing this notion that we are an inclusive uh, site um, and we are uh, an inclusive uh, region or business unit? And even if you're at corporate, um, that we are include that we are inclusive. Are you symbolizing that to um, all of your employees? And if not, what are the ways and the intervention that you can do to sort of course correct correct that? So our BRGs again have been. Ex extremely, and this is really sort of shows the partnership between the BRGs and the business. Uh, the BRGs kind of catalyzed uh, this movement and, and um, worked with business leaders within the, the sites and across the across our, our regions uh, to to start elevating and amplifying these lists of things that they would find that served as a symbol of exclusion and systematically started to eliminate them um, um, in in service of building a much more inclusive culture. Um, so that was, I think, a, a, a really great example of how um, something like our BRGs sort of help us um, help us do this work um, in real time and and a practical application. I think anyone can take away. Uh, so if you move to the next slide, this is um, where we'll sort of talk a little bit about sort of the connection and the thread um, that pulls through. You can see here the overarching sort of purpose of Newmont um, and how that ties to our values of one of which I mentioned was inclusion and then our people vision and how all of that is connected around sort of what is the culture that that presents itself, right? So what are the systems, the symbols and the behaviors um, that that uh, signify or identify to folks. This is this is the the, the this is the culture that exists here, um, and some simple questions that uh, individuals can ask themselves around when you're doing investigation around uh, what is our culture. I mean, we have a sense of what we want it to be, um, but what fundamentally is it, and are we aligned to it, or is it sort of divergent from what we're hoping it, what we're hoping it is? Um, and a simple question that you can ask is, what are people saying? 
what are people, if you were to pop yourself uh, in a room, um, sort of a, a fly on the wall sort of analogy, um, what might people say about where where they are, a site where they're situated, um, if they're situated in a corporate office, what are the things that they say, what are the stories that they tell um, that, that, that gives you a good sense of are the systems, the symbols, and the behaviors in concert with each other? Um, or is there something sort of egregiously wrong that we need to investigate and, and figure out how to change? So our approach, Newmont's approach, has largely been centered around that understanding from a, from a sort of systematic standpoint of what are the systems that exist? Um, what are the symbols? Um, what are the, and what are the behaviors? And how do we make sure of what they are, right? So sort of, again, a baseline. Um, and then how do we measure, once we get a sense of where we are, how do we measure progress going forward? Um, and I think the um, TSM, I think certainly, um, uh, and the EDI protocol, as well as all the other protocols, certainly um, inform that, right? It, it pushes us to, to be more rigorous in, in our investigation and, and our measurement of progress against trying to create the right culture uh, within Newmont. Uh, so if we move over to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, the standard uh, itself. Um, really, the takeaway here, I think, is what, again, going back to the, my initial comment around creating the condition under which we operate, um, I think the, the protocol here certainly um, allows, you know, it, it pushes and stretches us to to ensure that we're thinking about it properly and thinking about it sort of in the right ways and then therefore embedding it into the work that we do. So you'll see here in, in bullet two, um, this year, uh, the idea is to make sure that we include it in our combined voluntary commitment assessment, which is effect effectively just saying, you know, there are things and programs and processes that exist already at Newmont. And to the extent that we can take uh, something like the EDI protocol and embed it in that, Number one, I think it, it allows the organization to not feel like it is an additional thing that we have to sort of take on um, and an, an additional body of work that we have to do. If you embed it into something that already exists and, and, and things that we already, we as an organization are already used to moving forward, um, then it simply just becomes the work, right? It becomes the thing that you already do sort of day in and day out. It becomes a part of the policy you're already sort of used to following, et cetera. And so I think, that's a that's a really good um, uh, test and 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 uh, investigation for for Newmont as well. The EDI protocol, when you look through and read through all the different um, requirements to meet um, all the way up to AAA, um, it's really helpful for us to to again act as a as a test and or validation uh, that the things that we're doing and the way that we're approaching this work um, is is at least to an extent substantiated. Um, so that's how we're we're looking at the, the protocol. How do we embed it into sort of the things that we're already doing, uh, such that it just becomes the work that that we do and that we already do. Um, and the last slide, I think, is just to really sort of tying everything together um, is lessons learned. Um, one of the things I like to to think is that you have to look back in order to look forward. So it's always really uh, good and useful, I think, to understand where you're coming from. On the previous slide, when you sort of saw the, the multi-year journey that we took on, I think it's always important to fold in uh, some look back periods to understand um, what have you learned, right? What, what worked, um, what didn't work. There's going to be probably quite a bit that did not work, and that's okay. Um, this work, again, as I mentioned before, is quite complex. Um, and you try some things, and you test some things out, and you understand um, by your measurement, are we, are we actually making a difference? And if not, then you pivot. Um, and so I think it's very useful to, to talk through what have we learned, what are the different things that um, we attempted to do and, and perhaps didn't go well, what are the things that we attempted to do that did go well, and how do we make sure we do more of that and, and sort of less of, of the former, and, and you move forward. So just some, some key insights here um, on the lessons learned piece. Going forward, and again, I think the, the protocol will, will help us um, evolve into sort of the next the next part and portion of our journey is is really to enhance the framework around um, our inclusion and diversity efforts and and really put put some additional rigor on um, understanding sort of what the landscape is and how we're measuring things going forward. Um, continue to increase our focus on working together. 
Um, and, and how do we ensure that the behaviors that we want to see, that our leadership understands, that we're very clear on what those behaviors are, um, uh, and then also measuring um, from a performance sort of review standpoint, measuring that our leaders are, are adhering to that and, and frankly, and leading, leading in the, the way that we would want them to lead. Um, continuing to sort of investigate um, and amplify, recognize the support of the work that our BRGs are doing. They're such a critical accelerator for us. Um, and we want to make sure that they continue to feel supported in the work that they do um, and continue to tie that work back into the business and to make sure that that, that connection is seamless and, and fluid. Um, so all in, um, I, uh, I just want to sort of want to, again, overemphasize that um, this work is, is it's a journey. Um, it's, there is no sort of silver bullet uh, to take this on. Newman is an, an incredible, uh, incredibly value driven organization. Um, and so it matters to us a great deal that uh, we are making progress in this space and we're doing things, uh, doing things in the right way and, and being transparent about how we're trying things and how we're trying to move forward and making sure that we're listening and we're staying connected to, again, what's working, what's not working and how do we rigorously sort of test um, our resolve and our commitments that we are in fact making uh, positive change. Um, so I'll stop there um, and I'll uh, pass it on to, to Leslie. And then at the end, I think happy to answer uh, any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uche, and thank you everyone. Wow, what great thoughtful presentations and so much going on. I'm really happy to be with everyone today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, we're talking today about the leadership and strategy components of TSM, and I'm going to give a little bit of context there. Um, maybe we can move to the next slide, Miralu. I want to talk briefly about MIR because I realize I neglected to do that in the first webinar. Uh, speak a little bit about EDI generally, and maybe I may be able to, I'm finding that I might be able to answer some of the questions that are coming up in the chat, uh, talk about the indicator one, and then the tools and resources that MIR has developed that will support implementation of indicator one. So the next slide. Um, MIR is a not-for-profit, uh, independent not-for-profit or organization that leads collaboration among mining and exploration stakeholders. Our focus is on understanding labor market trends, identifying opportunities, and developing solutions that support the sector. Our strategic priorities are focused on labor market information, inclusion, diversity, and career development, national occupational standards and workforce development, and strategic engagements and partnerships. Um, if you haven't been to our website, I welcome you to, to go there and take a look at mir.ca. Next, so moving along, I wanted to just give a little flashpoint about EDI. Building on everybody's comments about this being a continuous journey, sometimes I find it helpful to just go back and think about well, what are we talking about here? So on the next slide, I just wanted to highlight the thinking about equity and some confusion sometimes that people have about equity and equality and different language uh, that, that appears in this, in this school of thought around EDI. So equity is about leveling the playing, playing ground of privilege on which our society really is built. And we see that through colonization, through racial discrimination, through gender, inequity. And in the last session, uh, one of the participants rightly pointed out that we're functioning in a broader social context. And this is what we're also trying to address. And that broader social context shows up in our workplace. So it's very much about acknowledging the power and the, that we have and the power dynamics at play, different forms that are of power that are are at play and figuring out ways to use the power we have to make this positive change. Now, to be clear, equity is not about compromising merit, but it is about, I like to think about it currently, my thinking is constantly evolving about, around, on these topics, but I like to think about it 
currently about facilitating the expression of merit. So we do that through a number of things, and this isn't a, 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 an exhaustive list, but some examples are we do that, we facilitate the expression of merit by access. And one of the ways we know that we've done that historically is by building ramps into buildings so that people who have different physical uh, needs can access a building. We do that by accommodating needs. For example, in school, we do that for allowing students who have uh, who have uh, particular needs, needs that are appropriate to this, will allow more time on an exam. And then lastly, we do that by acknowledging diversity, reaching objectives through different activities, different pathways, different mechanisms, because we understand that not one one approach or one pathway is 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 going to work for everybody, and so that facilitates the expression of merit um, by uh, taking some of these approaches to build fairness into our processes. So next slide. In terms of valuing, we talk about diversity, and I think about it in terms of valuing diversity, um, and this contributes to things like problem solving, creativity, and innovation. So a really good example of this I find in the, in the mining sector is thinking about how we approach uh, health and safety and how we identify and address risks and how diverse perspectives on with regard to a hazard help to improve risk management. If we're not valuing the diversity that's coming forward in that moment, we risk missing something and not fully addressing the problem or not being fully innovative uh, around that problem. Uh, so the next slide, there was a question in the chat about um, inclusion. So I'll get to that, uh, I think through this, some pieces here. Inclusion relates to the second and third levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which relates to freedom from fear and the sense of connection. So this, this also builds out some of these links that we're talking about through the revised protocol on safe, healthy and respectful workplaces. It touches on these elements of psychological safety. So in my practice around EDI, I think about inclusion and how it corresponds to respect for human dignity. So that's the belief that all people hold a special value tied solely to their humanity. It transcends race, class, gender, and relates to our inherent value as unique human beings. It's not something that's earned, it's something that we're born with, and it hasn't got anything to do with whether I like someone, whether I agree with them, or with whether we live in different ways. So in the EDI field, uh, historically, efforts have been focused on changing systems to include different groups. Um, recent work is more focused on belonging. And I think as I'm following the discussions around this, I think it's about people are getting at a way of how, how we measure, or how we gauge belonging. So where historically we've thought about adding, adding people and helping, helping people to feel included, to our historical or traditional systems. This is about ensuring, taking our cues from people on site in the spaces we're trying to change and seeing if they actually feel uh, belonging. Um, I'm going to put in the chat, there's a little bit of a framework on inclusion that I find helpful. Uh, and so I'll put that in the chat for you to, to consider. Along the lines of frameworks, just moving to the next slide, I wanted to share with you some thinking that I'm working on uh, in this space and trying to adapt this to make it uh, helpful uh, to the mining sector. So this slide just kind of runs through th two different uh, frameworks, if you will. And as E.J. and Jackie said, this is a continuous journey. And I'm sharing this information, these frameworks with a view to helping you to say, well, maybe we're here, or maybe with respect to our efforts around X, we're here, but around Y, we're here. 
and just thinking about, okay, how can we continue, as, continue to move along, which is really what TSM is about. So uh, the first schema, uh, as you see on the slide, has four points, and it begins with kind of a heroes and holidays approach, where we acknowledge and recognize different dates throughout the calendar year. And sometimes that's part of an approach that focuses on the contributions of different individuals and different groups. It's an excellent starting point for, uh, for uh, raising awareness and for gauging conversation and getting people engaged with, um, with diverse communities and with diverse perspectives. Then there's an additive approach where processes remain the same and there's a, a limited change. People, an example of this is that we have, an, we have a recruitment process and we ask people to request accommodations through that recruitment process. Or another example is, you know, we, we make a little bit of change to kind of a washroom setup to, to accommodate a particular need or uh, see how, uh, how that addition can be made, but we're not really changing the structures and processes. And on this note, and kind of an example of this is from the last session, uh, I spoke about how mining had been going on in Canada for some period of time. And I referred to Martin Frobisher, who had been trying to uh, took some ore, thinking that there was gold there and that the mining Mining in Canada dated back to 1576 or 1577. Well, afterwards, I was thinking, well, it's curious. I don't really know very much about what happened before that. We don't really know about how minerals and metals were gathered or considered by an Inuit inhabitants prior to that. And so that's an example of how you start to see our approaches changing and thinking about um, having a bit of expansion there in our thinking. The next approach is kind of a transformative approach, which is more along the lines of what Uche and, and Gaki are, are talking about and moving through into that last phase, which I'll get to, where you have diverse perspectives are infused into your processes, ways of knowing and experiences of different groups are heard and accounted for and the workplace becomes a complex synthesis of interactions among diverse groups in the workplace on a more uh, balanced playing field, if you will. And then there's the last piece uh, on this first framework that's about decision-making and social action, where individual thinking and decision-making is empowered and people have a sense of confidence, effic efficacy and competency in the workplace, where people are helping to address problems uh, that they're encountering. And so a really, a really good example of us moving along in this way, in this, at this level, is I'm hearing a lot uh, from folks that I'm talking to in the sector, that people are saying, you know, as the sector diversifies, sometimes I just don't know what to say. I don't know how to collaborate on a team that's more mixed. And so getting to this piece will help enable people uh, to do, to make those changes and to interact um, more, uh, more ably, more capably, more confidently, and more respectfully, going back to this piece of human dignity um, that, I'm, that I was talking about earlier. I hope that first schema is kind of helpful. And then I'll run through quickly a second schema, which I think we can kind of plot the trajectory in terms of the sector, but also maybe in terms of in, in unique companies and maybe even unique sites. The first is looking at difference where it's a deficit. And I would say historically, women, you know, being prevented from being in mining, as we talked about in the lax sector, you see that difference as deficit and, and separation from the sector. Then you, that difference as deficit kind of moves into Let's kind of maintain the status quo where we have a little bit of change. We might see that in the boardroom or the workplace in particular roles or areas. Um, 
And so there's a little bit of movement, but the status quo is really continues to be maintained. Then there's an element of difference being tolerated. There's some symbolic change, which maybe corresponds to that heroes and holidays approach. And then there's some evolution. And this is a real place of change where there's change of fit, afoot. There's awareness of systemic discrimination, such as we saw in through the creation of the protocols themselves, through the creation of Mac's statement on equity, diversity, and inclusion. There's training, there's emergent accountability, and we see engagement and some structures. And then we move on to difference being an asset where we see structural and, uh, and relational uh, change. So you move finally in that transformational state place to maybe there's more of a relational culture than a transactional culture. There's a collaborative organizational st structure that has an asset-based approach and people have agency and this sense of possibility, which corresponds to innovation that we've been talking about. I hope that's helpful. It's a lot of thinking, but it's really just to help you think about where are we? Where are we going? What are some of the different approaches we can take? And I continue to work on that to, to kind of try to help uh, meld that to the sector and make it useful for the sector. So on to the next slide. In the last webinar, Catherine Goslin kindly gave us an overview of TSM and the new and revised protocols. Um, because I wanted to focus on, we're focused on indicator one today, I want to just remind us again with this idea of continuous journey that the purpose of the TSM protocol is to facilitate continual performance improvements toward workplaces that practice equity, diversity, and inclusion. Really very much a journey. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So indicator one involves these uh, key elements of having a corporate commitment, an action plan, corporate strategy, engagement, communication, issues reporting, indi independent review, and then sub subsequently uh, linking to indicators two and three, which are more site-based. The, the orientation of indicator one is to confirm that the corporate office engages to develop a corporate strategy. So it's really centered, centered on that strategy piece. Next slide. I'm going to, in the interest of slide, I'm going to, of time, I'm going to jump forward, uh, Mary Lou, to the first slide that has uh, has that blue box on it that says change management on it. If we're there, um, so just by way of a little bit of an overview, thinking about these frameworks, Mir is, um, and this slide I shared in the last session as well, but I wanted to recap this. MIR offers online training modules. It currently has Indigenous awareness and intercultural awareness. And we are revising our gender equity and mining uh, training to be less uh, binary in its orientation to, so that it addresses gender identity and gender diversity and gender expression. And then also we have a training program on bias, uh, anti-racism uh, and discrimination. Our thinking on this is that these modules will support learning. And then there are a host of change management tools uh, that will come through the center, if you will, and that will facilitate uh, companies orienting their efforts in keeping with what's right for them. So TSM does acknowledge that while some companies may begin their journey by focusing on certain underrepresented groups, the ultimate aim is to create a workplace that is equitable and inclusive for everyone. So companies may, focus, may begin by focusing on one group and we're trying to create tools and resources that will facilitate that. So the next slide. So uh, I think we're on, we're a little bit further down. Keep going. 
keep going one more. There you go. So here are some of the tools that we we uh, will be in the full toolkit, a case for EDI in mining, a series of guides and infographics, a number of tip sheets and postcards, a template, templates, and then a matrix or key that will help you understand which, uh, which materials correspond to uh, which elements of the indicators and, and the TSM protocol. So you'll be able to easily say, okay, I'm going to use this tip sheet if I want, if I'm trying to address this uh, TSM criteria. So next slide. Then those, uh, these elements are also going to be paired with uh, mining mirrors, a refresh of mirrors diversity network, which I'll speak to more fully in a moment. And all of these will be housed and hosted on MIRS EDI uh, web pages. So getting to all of these materials were, we are, will be available in English and French, and they have reviewed by subject matter experts within the sector through MIR committees, as well as equity deserving groups, uh, reflecting indigenous newcomer immigrant uh, women to SLGBTQIA, anti-racist educators, uh, disabled communities, and um, or communities, persons with disabilities, and legal teams. So moving next. Oh, sorry, we've gotten a bit jumbled. That go past that one, please, Marion. Thank you. So in particular, on EDI Toolkit 1, we're looking at the case for advancing equity, valuing diversity, uh, and practicing inclusion in mining. Uh, there, there's a guide and infographic that will help particularly on developing a corporate EDI strategy. And there is a, a, a comprehensive tip sheet, I'll say, on developing a corporate EDI commitment, plus an annotated example, a uh, tip sheet on engaging communities of interest, and then a tip sheet and a post postcard on using inclusive language. So the key there is that uh, there's a bit of controversy, I'll say, about these toolkits, or sorry, about these cases. Um, people talk about whether or not it's necessary to have a business case, but we thought that it would be helpful just in terms of recognizing not only that EDI is the right thing to do, but in supporting organizations to make the, the connection with EDI and their core corporate functions. So next slide. So toolkits and training programs are wonderful, but there are some challenges in terms of bringing them to light. And I'm just gonna speak briefly to two or three of these challenges. One is this, this slide I wanted to uh, depict uh, these key elements of TSM, but the challenge of bringing those into alignment uh, within your organization. Um, Uche and Jackie spoke very well and depicted really well how they do that, but that's really is a challenge and it's a particular skill to help support your staff in uh, as they implement to bring this alignment. So it does really involve a fully collaborative approach uh, in doing that. Uh, the next is, oh, on to the next slide. The next challenge in practice is integration. So this slide actually depicts a number of the elements that are highlighted in TSM indicator one. So not only are you trying to align across functions, but you're also trying to, as Uche said, embed, uh, build from where you are and embed. So it doesn't seem like an additional item, but it's something that becomes part of the regular practice, part of the condition of how, how you're operating. Next slide. Talks Another challenge about putting EDI into practice is contextualizing it. And this is something else that Jackie and Uche both spoke about to contextualizing it, uh, 
contextualizing the TSM protocol and the requirements to your organization, to contextualizing it to the communities in which you're operating and in which you're with which you're interfacing, con contextualizing it to site to the unique culture of your organization. And so this is where for us, uh, Mir is created and, and will continue to support the ensemble network because it, it, we see that network of, of colleagues, uh, an opportunity for helping people to grapple with that contextualization while at the same time learning uh, from one another about how to implement, how to exchange information about approaches, successes, and grapple with challenges. And I think, again, I'll highlight the importance of what we learn from our discussions of safety and how important many minds and open exchange are to the resolution of safety issues. The same is very much the case for um, EDI and moving that through into contextualization in your organization. Similarly, just onto my last slide, the last practice challenge is really relating. So in the EDI, it's helping to support us to relate to one another, uh, ac sometimes across differences. Relating EDI to our roles and responsibilities, relating EDI to initiatives and programs that are uh, top of mind, and relating EDI to uh, performance. TSM has done a a really good job of embedding that um, into the criteria. But again, the Ensemble Network can help support uh, organizations as they move through this continuous journey um, that we've made uh, a journey of learning, recognizing, acting, and reflecting, um, and, and bringing that to life within your organization. I think that covers all that I wanted to say today, bringing me to my last slide. I hope that's helpful. And I think with everyone, I welcome further discussion about this so we can help help one another move along. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, just wanna invite Uche and uh, Dr. Jackie to put, to put their cameras on. Um, thank you so much, uh, all of you for very informative uh, presentations. I know that folks in the call are eager to maybe get some responses to, to some follow-up questions. Uh, the first one I'm just gonna dive right into is uh, for tech. Um, is uh, This is a, around measuring, measuring competencies. Uh, are we good? Uh, yeah, okay, good. Um, this question is, uh, is tech, or how is tech measuring leadership competency for example, EQ and the related outcomes regarding high uh, EQ abilities. Is it correlated against any increase in psychological safety? That's a great question. So what I would say is we don't do a specific assessment of our leadership teams from a EQ perspective. We do a, a inclusive leadership and inclusive behaviors that we expect, which align with our core values as an organization. And there is a correlation to psychological safety in that um, if you don't uh, feel safe, you're not safe. And it's that simple. And so you need to have leaders that are creating an environment where you feel um, safe. And, and I saw a question around um, you know, inclusion versus belonging. And I know there's a lot of conversation about it. I would submit to the group that inclusion creates a sense of belonging. And so you need it to have that connectivity and you need that psychologically safe space to be able to say, I feel like I belong to this team and I can belong as who I am. I don't have to change who I am to be a part of this team. Okay, uh, so thank you. Uh, second, another question that, that came through is, you know, what is the difference I think I asked this question in the chat, actually. We've been collecting questions, but anyways, this was my question, is uh, you mentioned uh, having an EDI committee versus an employee inclusion network. And I was just curious, and then inclusion centers. Uh, so with inclusion centers, the question was very, was very straightforward around, is it employee led? Are you doing peer training to staff up the inclusion centers or is it actually psychologists that coming from the market? Okay, great question. So our EDI committees, 
are yeah. um, uh, similar to, as Uche said, they are around the globe. They yeah. are um, it, led by employees um, in different business units. And so um, that's very much grassroots uh, employee led. Um, our uh, Inclusive Respectful Workplace Committee is, is a governance body um, that reports into the board. Um, our inclusion centers are actually staffed by um, external individuals. So there's arm length for confidentiality. And so they are accredited um, in the space of psychology and um, trauma informed uh, addiction health, mental health, uh, all different areas. Um, now, anyone can access those centers and that are employed or contractor um, that are in any of our operations or our projects. Wonderful. Um, and uh, the, okay, so I guess a follow-up question is around uh, the, um, the employee inclusion networks. Those are like the BRGs. Uh, so, yeah. you, you know, and I don't know folks on the call, you've probably heard different names, right? Some people call them affinity groups. Some people call them BRGs. I see tech is calling them employee inclusion networks. Uh, just Uche, uh, curious, is there, is there a differentiator for you in the specificity of specifically calling it uh, a business resource group? Yeah, thank you, uh, Teresa. Great question. So we yeah. did kind of uh, thoughtfully uh, think through sort of the, the 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 naming of them specifically because we wanted to be quite intentional of tying um, the the understanding of sort of the work that they could do and tying it back to the business. I think Leslie kind of touched on there is a little bit of trepidation around sort of underscoring the business um, purpose of of like your EDI um, kind of um, uh, programs and, and the business case for it. Um, but we, uh, Newman was you know, quite intentional labeling it as BRG because we yeah. think that is important to not lose sight of the human component of like why this work is important and why it matters. But there is also fundamentally a business impact as well, right? So making that sort of connection quite clear and, and sort of naming them business resource groups was, was a, a thoughtful exercise that we walked through. Oh, good. Awesome. Um, the other thing I, we, I wanted to get to is a question for you, Leslie, which is around, you know, you've shown a lot of toolkits and it looks like it's going to be really great content. Is there any, is there a link that you are able to share so that people can, um, can access those toolkits um, now, or is it coming later? It's coming, it's coming later, Teresa. We're really excited about it coming. It's co You'll see it by the end of March. Mm hmm but that's all I can say at this point. Okay. <laughs> at the end of March? Okay, okay. You'll all right. Maybe a little bit sooner. You'll see it really soon. We're working fast and furious. Uh, you know. Awesome. End of March um, 2024. Oh, perfect. Okay. The other the other thing that came up was around. Um, so what what I, was some of the things that are now going to we're going to go into a little bit more of the the protocol itself and some of the questions that are that are kind of surrounded. Uh, there there is a part of the protocol that really talks about this idea of an independent review. Uh, the question for the team is when it comes to independent review, a TSM is quite clear in saying that you can actually have an independent review from people within the same company. Or if you feel like it's too close, you can actually go external. I just wanted your thoughts, Jack, um, Jackie and Uche, on that requirement. And if it's something that uh, you know you would say do it, yeah, you can do it in the house. Or is it something that you would recommend that be done outside of the house? So Uche, if you want to go first, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think, <clears throat> excuse me. So we we do. Uh, Newmont and just generally across all the different things where we have assurance, um, we will do some things that are external. In other words, we'll bring an external um, individual to our external organization to come in and sort of assure some of uh, some different things. But there are also areas where we do the assurance internally by a group that is in within Newmont. I do think it's important to create a bit of distance from whoever is actually doing the work, that the assurance uh -huh. should not be that person or should not be that group, right? So the, the idea of whether to do it internal, internally or externally, I think boils down to uh, sufficient distance from who is doing the work um, and making sure that whoever is kind of just making sure that 
uh, the the processes and the and the the data and all of those things are where they need to be is not the individual who is actually performing um, that process and that work. So I think that's that's what I would say. So I guess maybe yeah. to boil that down is. I don't know that I have sort of a, a view on who what's more helpful to do an external or an internal. It's yeah. simply just whoever's doing the assurance, make sure that it's not the same person or the same group that is actually Connecting carrying the work. The work. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very interesting. And and Jackie, any any comment on that piece? I I agree with Uche. I think you, the most important thing is the accountability factor, and so that you recognize that you want to have you know, an independent review. What, who conducts that review depends on the skill sets that you have within the organization, you know, who is able to do something like that, whether you bring someone external in. I think it might also factor in where are you as an organization and, and what is the culture and what are people experiencing that may determine where you have to go. Um, I do think, though, that it is something that is necessary to show accountability. Right on. Okay, good, good, good. And, and something else that's uh, coming to my mind is, um, as you do, as you as you're looking at, uh, I think I'd reached out somebody who was talking about maturity models for companies and to see progress. Uh, to what extent do you see the TSM protocol being somebody something that your company can kind of uh, use as a bit of a maturity model? I saw Uche, you had um, you had really t talked about how Newmont is really looking to not look at this as a another as another, but looking and saying, okay, let's tie it into what we already do. To, so to what extent do you see that this TSM protocol is setting up, setting us up as an industry to have kind of a living document that is surpasses who's in role? Like I'm not, in, like if any of us are not in role, uh, what are your thoughts, Uche? And then I'll pivot back to, to Jackie. Yeah, I think some really key key points, if I can remember all of them, uh, Teresa, because I think there's, oh, there's some really good no, 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 that's actually really, that's a, that's a compliment because I think there's quite a few things you can unpack from that, that question. Um, so I will attempt to do that. Uh, one, I think, is the notion of um, having something living outside of just an individual. I think that is so key to ensure that whatever the programs and systems and things that you're setting up, that they far outlive you, right? You know, an individual could I don't know, win the lottery or, or you know, something else could happen and, and you don't want that sort of single point of failure. If that person leaves, then now everything is sort of done down. I think this goes also back to the notion that I think all of us raised around embedding the work, right? So mm -hmm. in, to making sure that it lives within the work that the organization does, not sort of as a stand aside, um, I think that will help um, make sure that, 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 that is, it is enduring. So I think certainly the protocol helps with that. Um, I might also say that the protocol, I think it's good in, in the sense that sometimes, and I think both Leslie and Jackie touched on this, it is difficult to know what to do and where to start and how to, what yeah. to tackle first and all these different things. So I think the, the protocol is quite helpful in framing a kind of what a pathway might look like. Um, but I also think that on the other side of that, it's important to say that uh, don't be so prescriptive that you're more focused on actually following the letter of the law, if you will, versus thinking about what you should be kind of investigating, right? There will, there will be no framework that is so comprehensive that all you simply must do is follow it sort of like letter by letter by letter. So I think uh, what the protocol I think helps, and I think maybe it's sort of is a useful watch out for, for, for anyone who's practicing, who's a practitioner, um, is that don't just kind of just um, prescriptively follow kind of a process, use it to think, use it to consider um, what you need to do, where your organization happens to be on their journey, and what are the different interventions they need they need to do. So in that regard, I think the protocol helps frame kind of the art of the possible and, and how you should be thinking through. Um, mm -hmm. But don't go so far. People, I think, should not go so far as to just follow it as a prescription because it shouldn't be used as that, I think. Yeah, yeah. Good. And, and Jackie, uh, Jackie, just for your, your point of view, um, do you want to just amplify that? that? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> very well said. I, I would also say, you know, use it in concert with other tools, like um, what Leslie walked us through, the work that Mira's put in. Um, I think, you know, for all of us in the industry, when we can come together and share, and Uche talked about this, when we can look at how do we make the industry as a whole better, um, mm -hmm. leverage what you can, um, you know, borrow what you can, uh, have conversations and, um, you know, 
make sure you're right sizing it for your organization. There is no single solution. There is not a right and wrong. There is progress. And that's what we need to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as, as our time is really winding down, I just want to invite people. I know that I know that sometimes some people feel isolated in these roles, right? Uh, where you're, you know, isolated within the organization, then maybe even sometimes isolated outside in industry. So I just do want to invite people that, you know, please, I'm just throwing my LinkedIn in the chat, feel free to connect through LinkedIn. But also what I want to say is that uh, CIM, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Advisory Committee, uh, does have that opportunity for stakeholders to join and participate. So I've, I'm just throwing my email in the chat. If you do want to participate in that uh, kind of committee, it's kind of like a way of coming together. Uh, I mean, there are many tools. There's Ensemble through Mayor, but I, I will speak for CIM uh, because what CIM is, of course, the large, largest organization in Canada representing mining groups. It is a way for us to come together and share experiences. So the offer is there, email, LinkedIn. Uh, the other piece I want to share is um, I was reminiscent in not mentioning that the, a large mining conference is coming up, PDA some of you on the call might be there. I would say, let's make an effort to connect. I feel like these conversations that we have like this that are so powerful to move our industry forward together as a whole. So let's, uh, you know, so PDAC is one. The other thing I was totally reminiscent in not doing is maybe opening up this whole event with a diversity share. It is Black History Month in Canada and us all, a lot of us on the call being Canadians, I, I do think it's a moment for us to kind of you know, reflect at, at the diversities that are in the room and what we're doing in our, in our various locations. So I uh, just wanted to, to point that out and flag it. And, and maybe selfishly, I, I do want to say I am usually on panels and Leslie knows this and I interact with lots of people in mining, but it's very rare for me to actually be with somebody else of color on a panel. So uh, this is the diversity and inclusion we talk about in mining and, you know, we're living, seeing it uh, here. Um, if your question was not answered, uh, I did have a computer issue happen where it wiped, I had to re-log in, so missed a, a bunch of questions. Thank you, Mary Lou, for helping. Uh, please email, stay in touch, and we'll really look forward to getting back to people that ask questions. I do want to give my co the panelists a chance to just have parting words. And Jackie, not to surprise you, but could you please go first and give us some parting words for this interaction? Uh, thanks so much, first off, for the opportunity and for everyone taking the time. I know how busy we are um, to share knowledge and learn, which is one of the things we've all said is critically important in the space of equity, diversity and inclusion. What I'd say is this is a journey. Um, it is small steps, sometimes a large step, sometimes a slide back, um, very similar to safety. We need to be committed, stay the course and just collaborate and have conversation. Awesome, thank you. And what about yourself, Uche? I uh, yes, uh, e echo everything that, that Jackie mentioned. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to speak. Um, and just to sort of underscore something that I had said initially, um, people should hopefully not feel that they need to go alone. Um, as I was listening to Jackie, both Jackie and Leslie's presentations, there were so many questions that I wanted to sort of jump in and ask, and uh, that just sparked a bunch of sort of thought in my head. So I, I, I will fully um, ensure that after this, that uh, I mean, Jackie, both Jackie and, and I and Leslie and I have sort of already kind of committed to staying connected. Um, but it's such invigorating, especially when you're doing this work kind of even if it's within your organization and to the extent mm -hmm. that your organization is supportive. I think that's helpful, but it sometimes can feel quite isolating. Um, and so the idea that you might have people who are willing to reach out and, and be thought partners and, and walk down a path with you, I think I can't um, overstate how important that is. Uh, so I intend to sort of live that commitment myself by, by staying connected with both Leslie and Jackie. But I would encourage folks as well to consider how they might do that for themselves. And to, I think, Teresa, you uh, uh, gave some ideas on this on the upcoming event that's happening for them to do that. Um, but just constantly be thinking about who can I connect with, who can I stay uh, together with, because as you go through rough patches, those connections will will be a savior. So uh, um, thank you again. Awesome. And Leslie, I don't know if I just give you an opportunity. You know, I just echo what people have said. It, we're on a journey. Let's all learn together. We'll learn from one another. It will be better. And, yeah. and things will move forward. It's, it's, it's great to be part of this conversation. 
Well, you know, this uh, just to close this off, really, it reminds me of that African proverb, proverb, right? That says, you know, if you want to go far, go alone, for sure, go alone. But if you want to go further, let's go together. So um, I would maybe invite us to uh, follow this African proverb. And uh, for Black History Month, I wish you all uh, great celebrations and great educational opportunities. And uh, just this is a, a great moment. Uh, just for the panelists on the call, you're spotlighted right now. We're just going to take a group photo. <laughs> So uh, please smile and um, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Okay. So everyone have a fantastic day and thank you for joining. Wishing you all the best and looking forward to connecting in the future. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.